evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to our August 2021 Local History Guild. Um, we've got some serious heavy history uh, to discuss tonight. Uh, and I, when I say serious heavy history, I'm not joking. It's uh, you're looking at, uh, you know, 700 and 733 pages uh, of, um, of American history. The first title, The First Reconstruction, Black Politics in America from the Revolution to the Civil War. Uh, this is a major piece of scholarship and it, and it came our way um, because the author, um, Professor Van Goss, um, seen here uh, on your screen, uh, wrote the book and he, um, and he used images from our collection. So naturally we get, you know, two complimentary copies of the book and, um, and you know, I, I, I read through it um, and said, wow, <laughs> this is some new stuff that I don't know anything about. And uh, I can't wait to talk to these guys, you know, Googling around a little bit. Um, uh, David uh, Wald Streicher, um, uh, distinguished professor of history at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, uh, has written uh, similar t uh, histories. Uh, Slavery's Constitution from Revolution to Ratification in 2009. Um, Runaway America, Benjamin Franklin, Slavery and the American Revolution. Uh, Van Goss himself teaches at, at Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Um, he's, he's written about Cuba and the Cold War. Uh, but, you know, this, uh, this book, you know, the first reconstruction, you know, I think, well, right away, the title uh, I find intriguing uh, because, you know, some have argued that, you know, among the most pivotal points in American history is the Reconstruction, you know, post Civil War period that you know really helped create the political and social structures for for modern America. But what's the first? Uh, what's the first Reconstruction, gentlemen? What's that all about? Well, thank you. That's a perfect way to start talking about the book. Um, so I'll let you in. This is the third title the book had, okay? Um, the first title for most of its existence, nearly all, was We Are Americans. Because um, anyone who picks up the book or just looks at the free preview on the University of North Carolina Press website, it's a free preview, first 70 pages, you can read the whole first chapter. And that phrase, We Are Americans, is repeated over and over in key political speeches, Henry Highland Garnett, in 1840, Frederick Douglass in 1853. It's basically a through line of free black men, many of them, you know, fugitives, formerly enslaved, saying we are Americans just as much as anyone, and indeed, perhaps more than some. Definitely people who, you know, don't practice Orthodox Protestant religion and speak English the way we do. So that claim, I use that title, and it's still not a bad title for the book. Um, but then I was sitting in a, in a workshop at the Graduate Center of the City of New York with my friend David which was really key. I finished the manuscript and we brought it to this workshop with some of the best scholars and tremendous grad students. And while I was sitting there talking about and getting great feedback, this is, gosh, David, this is quite a while ago, right? It's almost three years ago, it's amazing. And I suddenly had this little brainstorm that I wanted to call the book Native Sons, which just makes a similar point. We are Americans, Native Sons. And I was pretty pleased with that because it yeah, definitely well, expresses Richard, the problem. Richard Wright already did that. Well, so. this is the problem. <laughs> and we were pretty late in the production process. And University of North Carolina is a tremendous press. And they want to sell books. And they actually came back and said, you're going to confuse people with that title. They're going to think it's about Richard Wright. And they said, we, the title of your introduction is The First Reconstruction. We think that's the title of the book. And I thought about it for a few minutes. And I said, well, OK, they're right. So here's the point of this title. What is reconstruction in political terms? What does it describe? It describes what happens after the emancipation of enslaved people. What happens after the institution of chattel slavery is either is, begins to be eradicated through gradual emancipation or is eradicated instantly. Um, so there's a process of emancipation and then there's a process of reconstruction and the central question is, and I say there is a process of, not at one point, what will happen to the formerly enslaved people? They are going to have agency. They're going to want to either leave 
which is actually rarely what they do, except mostly in the 20th century out of the Deep South, they're going to either leave or they're going to demand citizenship. They are never going to be passive. Are they going to be let into citizenship? Or are they going to be pushed into some caste-like status? And there's no such thing as second-class citizenship. That's, an, that's a contradiction in terms. So reconstruction is really the process. Explain that for a minute. What do you mean by that? What, what do you mean by that? Well, you're, if you're not a citizen, then you're, you're other something else that is not a citizen. A citizen is someone with equal rights, in my, in, as far as I'm concerned. Second-class citizen is a way of evading the fact that you're not really a citizen. So emancipation is followed by reconstruction. And then I, and I'm not the only scholar who had this little brainstorm. In fact, Lorenzo Green, one of the great black scholars, but what was that, David, 80 years ago maybe, wrote a foundational book about black people in New England that is still absolutely key, Lorenzo Green, Green with an E in the end. And he pointed this out in effect, that there was an, a reconstruction all over the North because there is no part of the so-called North. Nobody called it the North in 1790. They didn't, they actually called where, where you're sitting the Eastern states. They didn't call it the North, the Eastern states, separate from New York, okay? Oh, yeah. Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. So there was a process of reconstruction that happened state by state because every one of those new states, formerly colonies, included enslaved people. There was no slave-free part. There were plenty of enslaved people as far north as, as Portland. Yeah, sure. In New Hampshire, yep. enough to be seen, enough to count, quite a few. So there is a process of reconstruction, gradual, that happens across the place that we begin to call the North. And that's where I got it. I said, okay, well, this is, and it's actually Stephen Hahn, you know, who won a Pulitzer Prize for his book, A Nation Under Our Feet. Stephen Hahn, and I quote him, he had a similar thought. I came to this, frankly, by myself. Stephen Hahn said there's a continuous process of emancipation and then reconstruction beginning in really at the revolution, formally speaking in Pennsylvania in 1780, when Pennsylvania legislates gradual emancipation. So we have to think of emancipation and then reconstruction as a continuous process from the revolution on. And in fact, from my perspective, and there is no question that I walk in you know, the shadow of Eric Foner, you know, and he casts this big light. He called the reconstruction, radical reconstruction, America's unfinished revolution. And I think that's true today, the end of 2021. It's that true it's the, today, today. It's like an today, unfinished today. revolution that didn't begin yep. in 1877 when yep. the last black troops left South Carolina. It's an unfinished revolution that began in 1775, if you want. So that's, that's my take. It's a first and we've had it, we, we're still in one. Manning Marable, the great black scholar who really deeply, I didn't know him very well, but his work influenced me. He was calling back in the 1980s for a third reconstruction. First, 1870s or 1865, 1877. Second, 1955, 1975, maybe. Third, he was calling for it in the 80s. So here we are, continuous reconstruction called for. That's my answer. Wow. Gosh, that's a, that's a, that's a lot to digest. Um, you know, it, from, from your book here, you know, you're, you're working, uh, you know, as far as, you know, it goes up to uh, the Republic, as far as New Bedford goes, you know, it's Republican ascendance, 1856 to 1860. And that's sort of the, that, that, that was a bit, you know, a bit of the startling aspect, you know, of the, of reading the chapter was that, at a certain point, the sort of the the, the influence and, and um, uh, involvement of the black electorate sort of falls off. But uh, is that is that a correct reading of that? Well, I mean, and, uh, every you know your 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 audience and you know the audience for the Whaling Museum. I mean, the reason I'm here is that that uh, there's a, a whole chapter in the book about New Bedford, building on extraordinary work by people like Catherine Grover, who I take. I mean, I salute a great yeah, historian. Right. So I basically am put, putting in the partisan politics on top of Captain Grover's work and other people's work. Um, New, you know, New Bedford in the 1830s and 40s and 50s, as far back as the 1830s, New Bedford is, well, um, you know, what, what's the phrase she called? The, the Gibraltar. Gibraltar is an image of a powerful fortress. New Bedford is a fortress of black power compared to anywhere else. There might be a couple of other places you could compare to it and maybe the Western Reserve in Ohio, but only late in the 1850s. Um, 
black men had been exercising independent political effect. This is measurable. This is clear in the newspapers as early as 1835, if not before. They were black. The they were independent. You call New Bedford a laboratory? Yes, exactly. Wait, oh, what uh, what, do you, what do you mean? What, what did you mean by a laboratory? It's a place where um, black men, because of the because of the weight of their electorate, they have enough because of their position in the labor force and because of their practical alliance with the Whig, the Whig Quaker elite of New Bedford. Everyone, maybe all the, this audience knows this, this is by far the richest place in America. Yeah, right. The per capita income is extraordinary and it is not, you know, black men are not excluded from that. There are some extremely wealthy black men in New Bedford. I mean, you know, the story of them fitting out the first whaling ship owned by black men in what, 1837? That's right. So they are part of that because they do have a real alliance with that Quaker Whig elite. And I described this. So they are, but that alliance does not make them subordinate. They are not a captured electorate. They start operating in the mid 1830s, maneuvering back and forth between the two parties in a startlingly modern way. Frankly, it's some politics I've done. You make both parties answer questions. You make both parties come to you and you say, oh, we'll endorse. By 1838, 1839, 40, they are cross endorsing Democrats and Whigs. I go into this in, shall we say, plenty of detail. I mean, yeah, it's really know. clear. There are yeah. And here's the other thing. Um, you know, there are people who try to make an argument for the anti-slavery or abolitionist wing of the Democratic Party in the North. I don't find that argument very convincing. It's, you know, Jonathan Earl tries hard and he, he gets some, yeah, there's some anti-slavery, but they're also white nationalists. In New Bedford, there are some really serious abolitionists in the, in the Democratic Party. Rodney French. Rodney French is, you know, that's allyship if you're ever going to find it. Why, at a certain point, it's just local idiosyncrasy, because these are real Democrats. They're not, they're full on, you know, full on Jackson Democrats, and yet they're abolitionists. So black men, when I said it's laboratory, a laboratory for political autonomy maneuvering between the parties. And it's happening year after year. I mean, I go year by year, actually, in the 1840s. It's very small, it's very focused history. Then black men, some of the same black men move into leadership in the Liberty, not in the Liberty Party, and then which goes into the Free Democratic Party, which goes into Rodney French's special coalition, which dominates New Bedford politics for about, what, six years, 1848, 19, 1854. So they're maneuvering. That's what I mean. There isn't any place else where you can see Black men with a substantial electorate, hundreds and hundreds of votes, moving around and getting party offices and being fought over and fighting back and the Whigs trying to hold them down and threatening them it's, you know, these stories that get passed around the country of Whig, you know, Whig, Whigs losing their facade of gentility and, oh, I'm your friend and going, I'm going to fire you if you don't vote the way I want in 1842. Mm. So that's what it's a laboratory these for. These parties there weren't there. There were factions in the Democrats and factions in the sure, Whigs. Too. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, there, there are, there are conservative Whigs, including Joseph Grinnell, who was really, yeah, right. a bad man, you know, yeah. um, I mean, part of the complication is Joseph Grinnell, the congressman, who, you know, Jim Crow's his railroads, but he's taken down, they knock him down hard. But part of the problem is he's also a really good friend. By friend, everyone knows what I mean, a Quaker. So the, the, the solidarity between the white Quakers will cross over between the most resolutely anti-slavery white Quakers. We're talking powerful leaders in the Whig party and someone like Grinnell, who is a Jim Crow guy, basically. So the partisan alliances cross over, including, the, you know, across black and white, across parties. And it's, you know, it is, it is as complicated as partisan alliances. It's are really today. complicated. I mean, that's I, what I mean by laboratory. So it makes New Bedford just a fascinating place. It's like a little preview of what, what could be, let's put it that way. Just simply but understanding what the parties stood for uh, is, is so challenging. It's like yes, understanding yeah. what's a Democrat and what do they stand for? What's a Whig? And what do yeah. they stand for? Yeah. So, yeah. You know, what's a free soiler and what do they actually stand yes. for? Yes. Um, you know, it, and, and uh, you know, so, you know, I found myself, you know, having to go spending a lot of time with encyclopedias um, yeah. and, uh, and other history books, you know, trying to, to um, uh, just make sure that I was properly oriented with the, with the basic structures of the parties, you know, because it, it's, it's so, it's so um, uh, uh, fractured, and in, in the you know the, the the support and the loyalties are, are fractured. 
uh, and I, I really, I like that aspect, you know, of, of what you write, you really have to pay attention. So, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a great history, you know, it, it's a learning experience, you know, it's new, it's new and fresh, at least from, from my point of view, you know, you write about Catherine Grover, Catherine Grover is brilliant. Um, you know, that's a, that's a brilliant book, The Fugitive of Gibraltar. Um, so um, let's see here. Um, I, I've got Russ. Uh, Russ here has a question for us. Did the federal government decide the mechanics of reconstruction for the states in rebellion? So that's one part of the question. And what about the states that remained in the union? And then were they allowed to establish their own mechanics for enfranchising uh, emancipated blacks? What do you think, David? I'm mute, I'm mute. I don't know if we I don't know if we can get into the whole history of reconstruction after the Civil War or or whether I'm the right person to do that. Um, one of the one of the parallels between the history that Van is telling before the Civil War and what happens after the Civil War in, in the what we usually consider to be reconstruction is the great variation between the states and between what we, we what really turn out to be several different parts of the South and on what or the and and or the border states, the states that remained in the Union like Kentucky and Maryland. And it isn't completely predictable and it's not uniform. And one of the reasons, one of the ways that Reconstruction got a lot more interesting after Eric Foner wrote his masterful synthesis of it 30 years ago was there was um, suddenly more tolerance for seeing the struggle for the black vote is central. And this is a process that ebbed and flowed and was violent and was also deeply electoral in a traditional American politics kind of ways where, where, a, lot, where a lot can turn on the results of one election um, and, um, and there's cheating and there's and, and, and all kinds of things going on. And that this is still, go I, Foner ended in, he ended the story kind of traditionally in 1877. Subsequently, historians have shown that there are places like Virginia where this struggle for the black vote, which is also a partisan struggle between, between surprisingly the Democratic Party, um, uh, as uh, Jane Daly has showed uh, into the 1890s uh, and in other places as well. So one of the things that Van's doing in saying that there's a first reconstruction is saying actually what happens in the North and this um, gradual process by which in some, some places like New Bedford looking very progressive where you have uh, blacks voting and determining elections and, uh, and then other places you see a backlash, you see it happening in New York in, in the early 18 teens and then they disfranchise people and then they're fighting for the, so, that, and so it yeah. doesn't go in, in one direction. Right, it's right. actually similar to what happens in various parts of the South in ways that you can't just predict by saying, oh, well, one state's more racist than the other, or here there are the, per the percentage of African-Americans is greater, so it's going to be that way. It's much less predictable, much more contested on the ground, much more surprising variations between cities and um, more rural areas, uh, and um, mediated by na sometimes mediated by things going on at the state and the national level, um, suddenly mattering on the local level, but maybe then, maybe a few years later, not mattering as much. So that this complicated aspect of the ways that black politics and party politics in America intersect and determine each other, that is, that's no, that, that, that starts to look not like this exceptional reconstruction, post-war Southern reconstruction thing, it starts to look like normal American politics even before the Civil War. And that's one of the larger messages here. So I haven't answered the question, but I hope I've pointed to the, the complexity of the answer to the question, and why I can't answer it and why we actually need to look before the Civil War and to see how we got to that point where the whole thing replays itself as a result of, of the emancipation that occurs during the Civil War. And, and yeah, be, before we move on, uh, thank you uh, uh, yeah, very much, David. Before we move on to the next question, I think you know one of the aspects of this that I think bears a, a bit of scrutiny. It's a it's a history 101 question for you guys. But the fact that there's a black electorate at all, at all, I think might come as a surprise to some folks mm -hmm. uh, and might bear a bit of a, a, an explanation that there were in fact plenty of 
of uh, black people who were able to vote, black men, I suppose, right? Black men who were able to vote in a variety of states in a number of different locales. And that had that ebbed and flowed, but it was a reality. Um, the reason I bring it up is I was giving a tour to some school children um, and th these were kids. These were like, I don't know, they were seven or eight or nine years old. And uh, one of them asked me, could black men vote? And this was, you know, we were talking about the turn of the century in, in New Bedford. And, uh, and I said, yes. And then later I was kind of kicking myself because it wasn't, black men couldn't vote nationally everywhere at the turn of the century. So I didn't give the best answer uh, to that. And, um, you know, as I read your book, and as I listen to you gentlemen speaking this evening, you know, I suppose there, the, the answer is not cut and dry, is it? No, no it's... Oh. Um, am I, am I on yeah. I mean, David said something so key and it's, it's the problem. It's the problem why my, why my book is long and why Eric Foner's book is long. If you're going to really take American politics seriously, given the, the, the constitutional and legal, I don't mean just what's in the books, but, but the customary order of the United States, from the founding on, you actually have to pay attention to how things actually operate at the state level and then below the state level and the political cultures of particular places, not just the laws or what is customary, but I mean, what is expected. And that's true today. And it was true at the founding. And if, you know, there's a certain impulse among historians, let alone among the public, to want to find convenient generalizations, to break it down into a few clear categories. But fundamentally, that's, you know, you can make up a fancy word like that's a mystification. It's just not, it's not accurate, you know? It's, it isn't actually like that. It really does matter where you are and what, what the traditions are there, the partisan traditions. And that means for a lot of detailed local history. One part of this is that, and then I wanna talk about what you, what you were just saying, could black men vote We're in New Bedford, but that, what the significance of that is. They could always vote in New Bedford. We know that the Cuffey brothers had trouble in 1780, but we'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, this, this question of, paying attention to how, what it was actually like locally. Um, that's true of where people are enslaved. And David pointed that out, that's what he said. You actually have to look at the pattern of enslavement. Not, we don't use the word slaves anymore, we say enslaved people. Well, how were people enslaved? How, to what, ex in what ways and to what extent and how could they become free, you know? In Dutch New York, before the British arrived, there were a lot of people who were half slaves, whatever, the, whatever that might mean. So you have to pay attention to the particularities. Now, um, there was an attempt to write, to put white suffrage into the Massachusetts Constitution in 1778. That attempt was defeated because when the draft constitution was sent out to all the towns in Massachusetts, among many other objections, a significant number of towns, and this, is, we did, this wasn't a vote, you know, it was like there were hundreds of towns, but a significant number, and they, many of them were quite big towns, said, and you know, the language is in my book. And this is not something that I discovered. This was known in the 1950s, actually, but nobody paid attention. A significant number of significant towns said, what are you talking about using complexion? And it's important that that is the word that was used, complexion, not color or race. You can't make com complexion the grounds on disfranchising, some, disfranchising someone. So they sent it back and it was taken out. And that was the last time in 1778 that anyone tried to disfranchise men of color anywhere in Northern New England, not Rhode Island and Connecticut, but Northern New England, Massachusetts and points North. We know that in the late 1780s, Prince Hall, a very prominent African-American, the founder of the Prince Hall Masons who exist today, Prince Hall was noted with respect as bringing his men to the polls, his men, the black Masons in Boston in 1788. And they offered themselves like as a political move to the, to the support of the state government during Shays' rebellion. So there was an established black electorate as of the late 1780s in Boston. Wow. And there's a plenty to say about them in Boston, in Salem. I have 
all the evidence you could want about black people voting and being fought over in Salem in, in the early 1800s. In New Bedford, I don't actually have the evidence until later, but it's clear they had been for a long time without any obstruction at all. So this is one of the weird things is that there were parts of the very early Republic where black men had always voted. So let's just get down to the specific legal issue. In 10 of the original 13 colonies, free black men voted. 10 of the 13. 10 of the 13 voted. Disfranchisement started very early in Maryland and Delaware, but some of them were grandfathered for quite a while. This was brought up by Abraham Lincoln in 1857, denouncing Dred Scott. He quoted Justice Curtis's dissent. Curtis was being, you know, Curtis couldn't Google this. Curtis knew of five states and he listed them and Lincoln quoted him. So why am I bringing this up? If Abraham Lincoln knew this in 1857, this was not an obscure fact. This was a well-known fact. And I wanna actually be saying, make one more point. You said black men, actually black women voted in New Jersey until 1807. If they were independent, they voted like white men. New Jersey had, and there was nothing obscure or over, it, was, it wasn't an accident. New Jersey enfranchised independent women from 1776 to 1807, wow. and that included some black women. If what happened after 1807? What happened to them after 1807? Well, there was a push by the, by the Jeffersonian Republicans, what for, for God knows what reason have been called Democratic Republicans for you know a long time. Nobody, they rarely called themselves that. They just called themselves Republicans. So I call them Jeffersonian Republicans to distinguish them from, you know, Lincoln Republicans. Right. Um, there was, you know, a big fight. The Federalists have hung on in New Jersey longer than elsewhere. And there was one of the, it appears that it was one of these sort of dirty little deals where the Jeff Jeffersonians would get expanded white suffrage in return for getting rid of the women and the blacks. And the Federalists wow. didn't object because they didn't want to get beat up for letting, you know, these a maneuver. So they rewrote the Constitution and put white in and made and white and men into the New Jersey Constitution. God, we are so still happened, having this conversation today. We're yeah, still having a conversation. Actually, I want to just David. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I, 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 you know, I, you know, I like to weigh in on this question. Uh, the, this. Uh, this peculiar, this seemingly peculiar fact that party competition from the beginning, from the Je Jeffersonian Republicans or Democratic Republicans, I'm not yet ready to give up. Their opponents call them Democrats. They some some of them call themselves Democrats. I'll still call them Democratic Republicans. Be from the beginning of American party politics, Jeffersonians against federal Federalists. The party competition encouraged some white people to bring blacks out to the polls and say, yeah, sure, you can vote. But that then, that dynamic, sometimes sometimes there's this beautiful thing where they're competing for black votes and all of a sudden more black people are voting, like Van described in New Bedford. But repeatedly, not finally, but cyclically, what happens, the more an issue of who votes as democratization happened and they're struggling and they're writing new constitution and who's going to vote and power is gonna be determined by who gets to vote and how many people vote, there starts to be an incentive for one party to draw lines and to cut deals. And so black enfranchisement happens because of partisanship and black disfranchisement happens because of partisanship. And this, happen, and this ha happens uh, again and again. And, and the story of democratization is also uh, in the antebellum period is also a story of repeated waves of enfranchisement, but a more a more compelling trend of disfranchisement precisely because of how much was at stake, how much was at stake for black people and how hard they fought, they fought for enfranchisement uh, in, in this process that Van describes, but also how much was at stake for the different parties who were afraid of what would happen if they lost control of who votes. Not just, and not just that black people might vote and determine their local elections, but also which white people were going to vote mm -hmm. in their state and in the nation. It's really also an absolutely, and I couldn't agree more. Um, a, I'm just going to state what David just described. Why would we not agree that this is happening through the present? That the constant, constant, constant push for, for de facto forms of racial or ethnic disfranchisement is based not on a racist ideology, and I'm not absolving anyone from racism. It is based on narrow, partisan, amoral power politics. That's what's happening in Texas today. 
They're not sitting around discussing racial theory and the superior to white people. They're thinking, we can get rid of that electorate. That's the continuity is we can get rid of that electorate, you know, and let's do it. But the other point that needs to be made is it would be an illusion to think that, yes, black disfranchisement has a special and constant quality. There are plenty of attempts to disfranchise other people. There are decades of attempts to disfranchise. I don't want to talk about immigrants. That's not the right word. Disfranchise Catholics yep. in New England and often the same people who were quite willing to enfranchise after. African-American men or, or bring them out to vote or encourage them or really wanted to disfranchise Catholics, meaning Irish, and um, be because they were a hostile electorate, you know? And so there is just a pure um, venal partisan aspect to this, which is, it is foolish to pretend it's not there. Um, do you agree with that, David? Yes, oh, uh, completely. And I had, and that was, that was partly what I had in mind as you, yeah. as you discerned. Uh, but um, part, even some of, the rhetoric of, uh, of um, we are Americans that Van pointed out, that black Americanism of, the, of Frederick Douglass and, and others, some of that was a deliberate attempt to appeal to say, not only are we are Americans, it's, it's directly about the vote. We're Americans, we deserve to vote too. But it's also saying we're more American than these people who arrived yesterday. So you should enfranchise us first. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a, it's a, dog, it's, it's, um, it's a black, some of it was, I mean, you could call it a black dog whistle. <laughs> you know, I mean, it really was, it was a kind of nativism. Uh, yeah. And it was uh, 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 for good reason, um, because um, uh, for, for good, I mean, good reason. I don't know, we, we want to say good, but um, for logical reasons, given the state of play and given what, how much was it, how, how much voting was tied to American identity. And how much the the there was a parallel debate going on about 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 ca about Catholics voting, about um, uh, recent arrivals voting, mm -hmm. that um, it was completely logical for for part of the argument to take the shape of we are native, and all that was implied was that we're culturally American. We know what voting is, unlike these people who come from. Mm -hmm. They're, they're Baptists and Methodists, and and a lot of the, uh, the leaders are Congregationalists and Episcopalians. I mean, that actually matters in a way that, I, in my experience, and I, I, in my experience, people today, even highly educated people, have almost no understanding of the of the just like absolute centrality to ordinary life, ordinary social life, political life of the Protestant religion, and which kind of Protestant you were. You know, I mean, were you? And and it seems so foreign and. And almost the people don't want to talk about this. Like it's embarrassing. What do you mean religion? It was a part of the vernacular. And it was, it is not an accident which churches black free black people chose to join. They, they were right. it was a conscious right. political choice. The, you know, the, the, the Methodist was to be in the largest denomination in the country. To be a congregationalist in New England or even outside of New England was had a certain intellectual cachet, right? To be an Episcopalian is another thing, especially in New York. So um so, I mean, David, David's point is the, the other part they would throw in, which was especially opportunistic. And I mean, I don't have a, personally, I, I'm not offended by people being opportunistic. How the hell are you supposed to maneuver when you're, you know, poor and often recently emancipated? And there are a lot of people who really don't like you, including the immigrant Irish, my forebears. Uh, shockingly racist for reasons that are, you know, Noel Ignatia wrote the book, How the Irish Became White. It's pretty ugly. Okay, the other piece of this is military service. Um, and in New England, that's real. There really are thousands of black veterans all over New England. In fact, a significant part of the black electorate are not in the cities. They're black men who got their land bounties as just like white veterans and moved out into the country in upstate New York, New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, Massachusetts, and really integrated into the communities. There's all these men who were revolutionary veterans. So they, um, when disfranchisement comes in, part of the we are Americans is we fought for this country, you know, our military service. And then General Andrew Jackson gives them this huge gift by uh, giving, well, it's actually not, David, it's not an oration, right? It's a letter that he writes because a large part of his army at New Orleans, by far the greatest American military victory before the Civil War, I would say, or before the Mexican War before the war of conquest in Mexico is, is beating the British in New Orleans, beating the best army in the world. 
except for Napoleon, and about a third of his army were black men. Now they were, you know, men of color who had left who had left Saint Domingue, Haiti, where they were the historic black militias that had been enrolled by the Spanish to put down slave insurrections. But they were men of color, and Andrew Jackson gave this famous, you know, wrote them a letter hailing them. I mean, really hailing them. Oh my God, you could. There are hundreds of instances of that speech being quoted across the North by black men to say, look, General Jackson, the founder of white nationalism. Right. This is another, uh, oh, did we lose your Failing band? us as fellow Americans. Oh, yeah. uh, I thought we, you froze for a second, so I thought we lost you. Okay, no. sorry. So there's military service, Protestant, Orthodox Protestantism and native birth, all of these things. This is the appeal. Can um, I? No. Can I jump in and, and, and point out a second, a second parallel to another parallel to Reconstruction is the role of veterans and the Union Leagues in Black politics in, Re in Reconstruction in the South, uh, which has been shown by many historians, is directly paralleled by the role that these uh, Revolutionary War veterans and, and later War of 1812, some War of 1812 veterans play in, in Black politics and in, in especially in public, in public events where they parade in arms and this and this and then you see that in these racist caricatures they love to they love to oh look at these they, they don't know what they're doing with all these they're carrying swords and maybe even and who knows what else right um and um this is uh this is kind of sort of ground zero of the, the uh, on the streets battle over citizenship who are black people are they fellow veterans are they fellow americans who fought for our liberties against the british or are they um not that, and there's a lot invested in forgetting the fact of how many uh, fought uh, for the United States and instead emphasizing those who may have fought with the British. Hey, you guys want to take a couple questions? Would you like to take the, a couple questions? The whaling, yeah, we got the Alan Wyman right. has a question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Okay, so Jeffrey Bolster, a, a fine historian, has a book called Black Jacks. And I didn't know any of this, but if you were to walk around, really, and not even the North, but in the North, the whole seaboard, all the whole seaboard, anywhere from the 1790s for decades on, almost everybody knew as a fact that black men were a major element of the merchant marine, you know, and of, the, and of the American Navy. It just was a, it was a, a niche in the labor market that they'd, take, they'd carved out early. Um, it's, it's, it's very onerous work, but Bolster's book, it's called Black Jacks, thank you, thank you David, um, uh, points this out. And the percentage is really high. So if you're sitting in 1810 and you're in New Bedford or Salem or, or Providence or Boston or New York, and you meet a free black man, you the chances are quite good that he will have spent time, real time on a ship. That's why Fred, Frederick Douglass gets his hands on some, a sailor outfit. That's his, that's his disguise to get from Baltimore to Philadelphia in a train, because people see a sailor, he had forged papers and they go, oh yeah, right, three black men, okay? So um, that's, that's part of New Bedford's history because there were a lot of black men on, on the whaling ships. And what Bolster points out is that a really surprising number of black men held what were considered officers' positions as stewards and cooks. To be a steward or a cook on one of these ships is way above an able-bodied seaman mm -hmm. because your role is more crucial. Mm -hmm. And there's probably, there's some, I'm, I haven't done the detailed work with the census. There are definitely some mates and there may have been a few captains. So they are, they are in New Bedford. I mean, this is, you know, think of, I mean, you say New Bedford to most Americans today and you say other than, you know, poor city in New England, they think Moby Dick. Need I say more? Of course, there are black men in Newton and Moby Dick, right? So Before there are a lot of downturn in the late 1830s. There were a lot of a lot of black, a lot of black men uh, in advanced positions in the whale fishery. And then right. after the de economic downturn in the 1830s, you start to see, you know, the, uh, the one or two. You'll see a steward. You'll see a cook, um, but you don't, you won't see masters, mates, and again until. Mm -hmm until late late in the fishery when you see a lot of Cape Verdean immigrants assuming those positions. Okay, you know more about, see, you know that. Then there's also the role of black men as artisans. There are, and I found an article, there are a really significant number of highly skilled artisans, dozens 
in New Bedford, even in the 1830s, including the man, and I'm blanking on the name, I mean, a really major inventor, the man who- Lewis invented, Temple. Thank you, Lewis Temple. He invents the toggle harpoon that makes it 10 times easier to put a whale out of its misery and you know, get a lot more whales. And he's well known, he's a well, his, that's a major invention. So even in the 1830s, um, the, the, the really key black newspaper out of New York, the Colored American, sends its, one of its correspondents up and says, New Bedford, my God, look at the houses they own, look at the skilled jobs they have, look how they're respected. And so there are artisans, there's also men doing, Nathan Johnson's really a great example. Nathan Johnson is a really well off confectioner, restaurateur, and porter. He's providing the, the treats the ice cream and the candies and all the good stuff to the wealthy Quaker elite. He's well, well known for this. He and his wife, not just he himself. Nathan Johnson is the man who welcomes Douglas, young Frederick Bailey in 1838. He's, he's sent to him. Nathan Johnson's a powerful political figure. He's led mobs to drive out informers. He's a Democrat. And he's very well off. And he is not on the ships, but he's serving the elite. So there's this kind of cross-class men on the ships, men artisans, you know, doing the hard work that keeps the ships going, and then merchants and entrepreneurs like Richard Johnson Sr., who is a major, you know, intercoastal shipper. Um, so the Polly Johnson, right? Exactly. So, um, so this is, you know, there. This is when I say black men are tied up with that wood Quaker elite. It's a very practical alliance. They're in there with them, and that's part of their political power. That they're in that position. What happens, and Michael, you may know a lot more about this. I just had to, I stopped in 1860. There's a whole later history. What happens to those black voters, to those political operators, to the lawyers like Henry Johnson, right? I have no idea, frankly. I have no idea. I haven't really looked into it. So it's, you know, there's another, there's another second half, you know, yeah. of, of yeah. the book to be written. Um, you know, the, the fact that this was such a really dynamic community for people of color, I think, is one of the great takeaways, you know, from the chapter. Um, you know, we're not going to go into the language uh, that you can get away with uh, in print. I'm not going to use the language, um, you know, now. Um, but, uh, it, it, you know, it's an eye opening. It's an eye opening text. You know, it really is. Um, what about this idea um, that uh, that Ann Kirschman is asking about? How well connected through communities were the black electorate? Well, um, David, do you want to take a crack? I've got plenty to say on this, but I don't want to hog it. I, I, I'm, I'm really curious to hear how, how, you, how you respond to this. Well, one of the points I make in the book is that because, let's see, it is a mistake to overemphasize the centrality of the federal government in this period. I don't think the US is a, is a, is a nation state in the modern sense, and I really mean it. It, is, it has a government that's very powerful when whoever controls it wants it to be powerful, when it wants the federal government to use military forces and God knows what else to drive Native Americans out, sure, you know, for, its, for certain purposes. But otherwise, state politics are much more central. That's where the patronage is, and there are, innumerable examples of people said, oh, I'll, I'll be a congressman for a year or two. I, no, it's more powerful to be a state senator. So that's number one. At the federal level, black, black men have almost no purchase at all. They can work through allies. The greatest ally right next to New Bedford is John Quincy Adams. They can work through him, some other people, William Seward actually, maybe even more than Quincy Adams. But this is an indirect politics. So they know perfectly well that their politics happens at the state level. They gather in national conventions, and Nathan Johnson of New Bedford is elected president of I believe, the 1847 convention. But people who put their emphasis on the national free colored conventions, there's a whole series of them, are kind of missing the boat. It's the state conventions that are really key. Now, this is where we get into the peculiarities of New England Black history. Because of the influence of William Lloyd Garrison and the Garrison, the, the Boston clique, I say it with a certain bitterness, out of you know, the Eastern Massachusetts Boston clique of Garrisonians. There is enough clout among the black members of the Boston clique, like William Cooper Nell, an admirable figure that prevents New Englanders 
from ever meeting in convention, with one exception up in Maine in 1841. Garrison and his black allies, they try to block the national conventions. They send Frederick Douglass and Charles Lennox Lumon to the 1843 one, where they are alone voted. I mean, they are standing alone, voting against black men meeting separately from white men. But they managed to keep New Englanders, black New Englanders, even the New Bedfordists, from meeting in state conventions. So they block what everybody else is. New York has so many state conventions, it's hard to keep track of. Even the states where they can't vote have conventions. There's a convention in Oregon, there are conventions in, in California. I mean, they're, they're just happening all over the place. So finally, the New Bedfordists, because they've had enough of this clearly, and they, they're the most autonomous, and they're really, they don't, they don't take it lying down. And they finally call a, there's this, they call a sequence of, I, I'm sorry, a memory serves. I think they call Massachusetts Convention in 1858 and a New England Convention in 1859, and maybe, I mean, maybe the next two years. But this is New Bedfordists with some allies in leadership. And even then they fight with the Black Garrisonians like Charles Lennox Remond out of Salem. So, but part of the problem is at those conventions, they have to, they have to re re recognize the reality that they are now incorporated into the Republican Party, which has effectively shut down real partisan competition for a while. The Republican Party in, in the, late, in the eight, later 1850s New England is so dominant, it has brought in the conservative nativists who don't care about black people very much one way or the other. It's brought in the radical Liberty Party people who are as radical as anyone has ever been, as white people have ever been in America, really. And it's got the black electorate and it's just got a whole mass of Whigs who will kind of go with them. So once you've got a party that's easily got 60, 65% of the electorate, well, then the black vote is less central and they can give them party offices, but they, they are not gonna be as key. And that's actually what the New Bedford leadership who are some very impressive men and some others they're dealing with. And how far can we go now? We can't get much farther than we are. So you've got Robert Morris, the great black lawyer up in Boston saying, we're gonna go into the state legislature, but you've got others like George T. Downing in Newport and a New Yorker brought to Rhode Island, brought to conservative Rhode Island, very conservative black electorate in Rhode Island. And you know George T. Downing is, I don't know what, what, how much the Republicans are gonna give us. So they're, they've reached the limit of their power, and, but New Bedford is actually at the center of that attempt to consolidate black unions. I don't know if that's helpful. Anne, I don't know if that answers some of your questions. I, I think there's a, uh, the way I would read the question is um, a little differently, which is um, that being politically active in the electoral politics sense, uh, the kind of organizing that, that was going on there, tended to drive people toward um, uh, uh, toward local local organizing. But it was a question of strategy that was talked about among African Americans in their newspapers at these state conventions. What should the strategy be? How much emphasis should we put on the kind of politics that Van's talking about? What role should it play in the anti-slavery movement? What role should it play? Uh, how much should we worry about what the state laws are and what they allow us to do and not do? Should we, and there, there are civil rights issues that aren't about the vote. There are other ones about things that are and aren't allowed to do that are, that are very material and that also have a relationship to voting. So that they might be, they, there are all kinds of laws um, relating to civil rights that are they're, uh, increasingly, uh, increasingly on the table and contested and, and, then, and including the issues around fugitive slaves. In many of these places, so there's a that we're all that these um for a long time in the scholarship, uh, all these issues were kind of um, funneled into a um, an interpretation. Okay, okay, of of anti-slavery strategy and did anti did did black and white anti-slavery activists what what were their strategies? Did they work together? Did they have a race-based strategy? Were they pro? Were they Anti -po were they pro were they anti politics electoral politics were they pro electoral politics Garrisonians versus non Garrisonians and all that's really important but there's a way in which the the, the questions were asked too narrowly and um, while Van is doing this there are other folks 
we're working, there's a colored conventions project led by Gabrielle Foreman at University of Delaware, where they are putting online all of the uh, documents from the colored conventions and all the newspaper and, and also like unearthing all the newspaper conversations about this and grad students are writing, writing their, their, their masters and uh, doctoral dissertations about this. And what they're discovering is, is there was precisely this kind of, were they connected or in communication with similar groups in other cities? Yes, they were. Um, in ways that were, uh, they were writing letters, they were going to these conventions, they were uh, contributing things to these, uh, to these, to various newspapers. And it was a long term conversation that was very, um, very charged, and uh, uh, not unlike the conversation about, about alliances and about race and about political strategy that hap that happened in the in the third reconstruction, or, the, or what we think of as the civil rights movement. And there, are, there are other networks that really have nothing to do with either anti-slavery or the politics I described. At, one, at a certain point, I noticed that there, there, was, there was a whole network of temperance organizing. And the temperance movement is a huge social movement. It's a self improvement yeah. movement. It's very real and it cuts across partisan politics. But for example, the single biggest section of my book is on New York State for good reason, because in 1841, New York State is one seventh of the electoral college, yeah. which is bigger than California today. And one of the cent uh, key figures, a guy named Stephen Myers, who is for decades allied, allied with William Seward and the Whig machine, the, the anti-Mason Whig Republican machine. So Myers is a really interesting political operator. Meanwhile, Myers is running a whole, his own temperance network that stretches all the way deep into New England and uh, all around. And this is a whole separate world you know, societies, including women. And because it's, so there's a whole, you know, there's, there's actually in terms of, I, David put in so much there, and there are just layers and layers of communication going on. And then there are the denominations. You know, probably, David, off the top of my head, can you imagine the books that could be written about the AME or the AME Zion, I mean, denomination, the end there? Because for those, for those denominations, and both David and I have worked on Philadelphia, which is the center of the AME church. You know, you actually rely on church histories and memoirs written in the 19th century. So it's, it's an, there's an extraordinary amount of, of cooperation and communication. Part of the problem is, is that we don't have, you know, the, tr the traditional archives of correspondence because those were only kept for by mm. powerful men. Mm. But, you know, who knows, maybe there will turn out to be more, maybe there will be diaries and letters found in attics. So um, I think that it's it's actually dense. Um, so that's a, that's one thought. Who is Douglas writing for? I'm sorry. Who? Who is Frederick Douglas writing for? I mean, you know, they're they're oh. act, you know they're they're bona fide you know actual books you know that address these subjects and yes, they're yes, yes. you yeah. know they're, oh, they're, yeah. they're, they're, they're they have a, a broad readership and is the is the, is that readership you know. Douglas, cross, cross race, it doesn't matter who reads the book. Doug, Douglas has many audiences and he knows each of them quite well. That's how I would put it. Yeah. I, my, my respect for Douglas is only increased by noticing what a no holds barred, big thinker, ruthless competitor he was. You know, he's, he's a, he's, if I say he's tricky, I say that with enormous respect. This was he's someone powerful. from 1848 through 1860 in every single election cycle managed to to proclaim his abstentionism, endorse the most radical possible person possible, and meanwhile, in one way or another, carry water, serious water, for whatever was the most practical anti-slavery option available. Actually, go back to 1844, Douglas is in New Bedford having one of, and I say this with frankly considerable experience, one of the most brutal sectarian partisan battles I've ever read about takes place in New Bedford in 1844 with Frederick Douglass, a young man, but already very skilled, and Charles Lennox Riemann, in there carrying water, everyone knows what I mean, de facto supporting the Whig Party against the Liberty Party supported by local New Bedford leadership. And, the, the, and it's in the book, the things they say about each other, ooh, it's ugly. So Douglas has a, a career of partisan politics even while he's a Garrisonian claiming to be non, totally opposed to partisan politics and later. But I don't, I'm not accusing him of dishonesty. I'm saying he understands how you, know, you have to be sophisticated if you're going to do this, and he it's does it really, really well. Superb. Well, his English audience, 
He's got his upstate New York audience. Douglas didn't go to Rochester because it was sort of a nice place. He went there because that was a place he could raise a lot of money and be safe. The people, one thing people, there's certain anecdotes that jump out to me. When the federal marshals came with the warrant for Virginia in 1859, because Douglas was implicated, he'd been in Chambersburg with John Brown. <laughs> the Virginia governor ordered his extradition. The marshals, the federal marshals under Democratic Party control were coming to Rochester for Douglas and the Lieutenant Governor of New York visited him and told him to go to Canada. Wow. That's why Douglas was in Rochester. Right. And, and to be protected. He was close to Canada. So and, uh, you mentioned the, his, he had many audiences. And that's part of the kind of, you know, the sophistication that, it, that I'm so struck by. And that's, again, what New Bedford represents to me. This extraordinary kind of like uh, cosmopolitan, that word has been used many times about New Bedford, cosmopolitan, politically sophisticated um, operation going lasting many decades. So, so this has been absolutely riveting. Uh, before we uh, before we wrap it up for the evening, do you guys have uh, anything, any final sort of statement or anything that you want to that you want to make? You know, buy my book or uh, you know, read David's book or read Van's book. <laughs> no, I, I, David, I'm blanking on the title of, of the first book. Could you please? Because I need to send it to people. What is it? My first book. Oh, in the midst of perpetual threats, the making of American nationalism, 1776. Yeah. So. Um, and I'm, and I'm, you know, this isn't a mutual affirmation. That's anyone who is interested in the kind of history we're doing. And I'm, so, you know, I'm doing like ultra traditional political history, but with the methodology that is, you know, more recent, which is to say cultural history, meaning paying a lot of attention to text, yeah. to culture, to say what people say, what's going on in their heads. Um, if, you can, if you want the fusion of that kind of history, there are a few bit books more influential and really good on New England than David's first book, In the Midst of Perpetual Fets, where he introduced the concept of sectional nationalism. So I've got that right, David, right? There are many different forms of nationalism. And if you want to understand New England, you have to understand their, their deeply anti-Southern New England nationalism, which is why, you know, they put, they don't just put secession on the table at, in 1815 in Hartford. Secession is on the table from the early 1800s on because they do not like living in a nation ruled by slaveholders for whom they have contempt. So um, get David, read that, read David. And that, that forms a background for under, to, and this, uh, this is, we're in New Bedford. That forms the background for understanding New England's remarkable, many different partisan cultures, but they are all part of New England. And I think that matters. It's what I call Yankee Republicanism. Guys, we're going to have to schedule a second one of these. I mean, look at, you know, Joseph Grinnell founded the Wamsutta Mills based ex yes, directly yes. on on Southern cotton and the availability of Southern cotton. And 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 he built the he built he, he founded the textile industry here on that. I mean, we're going to have to do this again. I mean, we're going to, you know, 740 pages of this book and we haven't even gotten to David yet. <laughs> So uh, yeah, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have to schedule a part two, um, okay. but uh, this is this has been great and uh, it is it it's time. So we're gonna um, uh, I hope everybody had a good time. And um, uh, what are we gonna do, Justin? Are we gonna talk about um, in October the local history guild is going on the road. That means that I'm getting in my car and going across the. Um, across the canal to the Bourne Historical Society to talk about the paintings of Charles Sidney Raleigh. Uh, the Bourne Historical Society has two big, beautiful paintings recently conserved uh, that they're hanging there. And we're gonna have a conversation with the conservators and we're gonna talk about Charles Sidney Raleigh's marine paintings and we're doing it at the Bourne Historical Society in a second. Uh, we'll get the date to y'all um, for October. Uh, but uh, David and Van Goss, Thank you very much. This was, thank it's you. great history, great conversation. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. You're very welcome. And I hope you gentlemen have a nice evening. We're going to hit the red button and, and say good night. Good night. Good night. Bye.